Thank you very much, Dr. Heron, for sharing all your experience with us. And um, our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Sass. He is anesthesia faculty here at LSU Shreveport. He's a director of airway as well as uh, equipment. Um, he's, uh, he's an uh, assistant professor, so please, uh, and he's going to be talking on um, airway management for one lung ventilation. So please welcome him. Thank you. Well, again, I appreciate Dr. Gongor's help because I didn't realize I had to wear a microphone while I was doing this. Uh, but let me uh, get started uh, with this. I actually was very glad to see uh, uh, Dr. Heron's uh, uh, lecture because for the first part of the morning, it seems like we were talking primarily about pediatrics. And since I'm talking about one lung ventilation, it's uh, really something that we're talking about more for adults rather than pediatrics. So I was glad to see him sort of move the discussion on from the pediatrics uh, more toward uh, the adult. Um, let's see, is this the, what changes the slides? This one? Or just, I guess I can do it up here just. The mouse, the mouse will do it, okay. Right. Okay, no, that's not the one. Okay, see, well, let's try it this way. There we go. Okay, so disclosure statement, first of all, I have no relationships with any industry to, to disclose for this that are relevant to the content of this CME activity. And what we're trying to uh, get across this morning is selecting the proper size of a double eliminated tracheal tube, uh, recognizing the alterations in physiology that accompany lung isolation and uh, how to uh, manage them effectively during surgery and identify some new devices actually uh, for lung isolation and uh, uh, I'm gonna go go beyond uh, what Dr. Heron even told you about this morning for a, a, an even newer device so first of all lung isolation well what is it well, here's a, a picture of what we're really looking for in one lung isolation is a collapsed lung on one side that is relatively still for the surgeon to do his surgical procedure while we are able to continue ventilating the other lung. Now, what we want to talk about today with one lung ventilation is why to do one lung ventilation, some of the devices that we use to accomplish one lung ventilation, and also discuss some of the pitfalls of, of doing that one lung ventilation and hopefully uh, learning how to get around some of those pitfalls. So why do we perform one lung ventilation in the first place? Well, you want to do it when, as I suggested already, when it's desirable to ventilate only one lung, then both lungs, and it's a standard approach to facilitate surgical exposure. Less commonly, it may be used to prevent, prevent soiling from an infected lung from one lung to the other lung and you use it to avoid ventilating a pathologic lung or may be useful in, when you've got a bullae or cyst in one lung that you're trying to uh, isolate for surgical resection while ventilating the other lung and it's also quite useful in a thoracoscopy this is a uh, a advanced procedure that's being done um, and let's see is this the laser yeah okay so here's the outside appearance of a vat procedure being done and uh, this is showing you the collapsed lung on the side where they're doing the work and you can see the inside of the thoracic wall there so there are some traditional approaches to lung isolation and there are some newer approaches the traditional approach uh, originally was just simply take an endotracheal tube and push it farther down uh, into one bronchus and you would then ventilate one lung uh, double luminated tracheal tubes were developed after that uh, and there were both right and left sided double luminated tracheal tubes developed and one of the new developments I want to tell you about a little later is the Vitacyte DL uh, but uh, we'll leave that and get to that in a few minutes other uh, devices that were not double luminated tracheal tubes that came about were the bronchial blocker and the easy blocker and we'll be able to see some of these uh, devices not only from what the representatives are showing you but also in the uh, lab uh, experience this afternoon. So how do you confirm that you've got lung isolated? Well the, the old original way was simply listen to the chest wall, listen to the right side, listen to the left side, hear breath sounds in one side, not hear breath sounds in the other side. But there are some better ways of doing it. Fiber optic bronchoscopy is certainly a, a 
a much better way than just listening to the chest. And uh, of course, the ultimate is when we're in surgery and the, the surgeon evaluates the lungs and can tell you whether it's, it's still or if that lung is still moving. So I had mentioned the single lumen tube placed in the main stem bronchus was one way of uh, isolating it. We can also use a single lumen tube and place a bronchial blocker through that uh, single lumen tube and we can use either right or left sided double lumen endotracheal tubes. The uh, lung isolation for surgical procedures now is most commonly accomplished using a double lumen endotracheal tube. It can usually be put in rather quickly, but sometimes we run into some challenges doing that, and it uh, typically allows uh, uh, better control of the lung and suctioning of the non-ventilated lung or the ventilated lung, and occasionally even reinflating the non-ventilated lung if we need to. So here's a picture of sort of the old original approach of just take the endotracheal tube and shove it down a little bit farther. So by doing so, the endotracheal tube can be advanced far enough to enter a single bronchus. Um, it's usually done blindly. You can also put a fiber optic uh, in, uh, scope through that to be sure you see where it's going. If you do it blindly, it's most likely going to go down the right uh, side, but not necessarily. Uh, I've been surprised many times to advance blindly and see it go into the left side. So it's not 100%, but most likely it'll go in the left side. And again, if you want to go with a single lumen tube into the left side, usually you're better off putting a uh, fiber optic bronchoscope in first, uh, finding the carina, moving the fiber optic scope into the side that you want to, and essentially using the fiber optic scope uh, almost as a stylet to slide the tube over it. So bronchial blockers came about and actually the, the Fogarty embolectomy catheter was sort of the granddaddy of the bronchial blockers. The Fogarty, endo, it, Fogarty embolectomy catheter is a single lumen balloon tipped catheter that has a removable stylet. It can be placed inside the endotracheal tube or it can be placed outside the endotracheal tube uh, into uh, one bronchial segment. It typically requires fiber optic bronchoscopy to position correctly and one of the interesting things about the Fogarty catheter that's not true for all bronchial blockers is that it can be used to occlude only a segment of a lung rather than the entire lung. Of course it is difficult to position properly and uh, there are some developments uh, since then that uh, have made this better. These are some of the newer bronchial blockers that have been developed. The Iron to Wire Guided Endobronchial Blocker, the Cohen Endobronchial Blocker, the Fuji Univent, the Uniblocker, and the Roosh Easy Blocker. All of them are high volume, low pressure balloons at the tip, and most have a hollow center channel. The hollow center channel can be used to provide CPAP, uh, continuous positive uh, pressure, or it can be used to suction to help that lung segment collapse. So here's the uh, old Arndt wire-guided endobronchial blocker. You'll notice that at the tip there's a little wire hook and the idea of this wire hook is to literally hook it around the fiber optic bronchoscope to help uh, move it into position. The Arndt uh, wire-guided endobronchial blocker was available in multiple sizes, a five French, seven French, or nine French catheter, and also available in a couple of different lengths. Uh, like all of these, the cuff design is for a high volume, low pressure balloon. Uh, the, this one happens to be available in two different shapes, either an elliptical or a spherical shape, and that's not true for most other bronchial blocker type of devices. Um, let's go to the next one and show you the Cohen tip deflecting into bronchial blocker which was developed. If you look right here where I have the arrow, it has a little thumb wheel on it that is used to deflect the tip in one direction or the other and there's a little arrow right here that can be seen uh, when you're doing fiber optic bronchoscopy and then the arrow helps to show you which way the, uh, uh, the deflection will go when you turn the thumb wheel. Next was the Fuji Univent, which was a combination endotracheal tube and bronchial blocker together. Uh, the 
bronchial blocker for this was so successful that they later marketed it as just a separate bronchial blocker by itself without the endotracheal tube being put being uh, in the same package with it and it does have a pre-shaped tip a little curve on it right here to let it uh, be positioned easily by rotating uh, the top part of it up here either clockwise or counterclockwise and then because of this little bend right here it will direct it to either right or left as you, you need to. So here's the, the same thing without the endotracheal tube. This is just the uniblocker which was uh, similar to the Univent tube but uh, made to be put through just a plain everyday uh, version of a single lumen endotracheal tube. It does have a hockey stick bend as they refer to it on the tip uh, as I mentioned before which gives you a uh, control so you can spin the top and, and have that move either right or left and this is the typical fiber optic video view that you get when a bronchial blocker is positioned correctly um, uh, as this shows into the left uh, bronchus. Newer development has been the Roosh Easy Blocker. And the Roosh Easy Blocker is a bifurcated blocker that makes it much easier to place through a single lumen endotracheal tube and really not have to worry about whether you're going to direct it to the right side or the left side because it's got a small balloon. They're collapsed when you put them in and then the Easy Blocker spreads out as it comes out of the endotracheal tube and enters uh, one side into the right uh, bronchus and one into the left bronchus then you simply inflate whichever one you want to occlude and continue ventilating with the other. There are a couple of caveats with using this though. Um, one of the caveats is the endotracheal tube cannot be too close to the carina or else it does not deploy correctly. As you can imagine the, as this tube is put in the single lumen endotracheal tube the two sides are collapsed and together and as it comes out the endotracheal tube it then spreads so that one side goes to the left one side goes to the right and if the tip of the endotracheal tube is too close to the carina it just doesn't give it the chance to get out of the endotracheal tube and spread correctly to go to right and left sides. So uh, I've pretty much gone over some of the uh, advantages and disadvantages here you cannot move it out to occlude a single uh, segment of a lung. It's occluding the entire lung, but it's uh, easy to position in both right and left bronchi. And here's sort of a, a table just of some characteristics and uh, comparisons of the various bronchial blockers. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, one thing to notice in particular with the easy blocker is you need to be about four centimeters above the carina with the endotracheal tube when you put that in. Okay, in general, putting a bronchial blocker in place is not considered difficult. Uh, airway injuries are less likely to occur with bronchial blockers than with double lumen tubes because significant airway injuries have been known to occur with double lumen endotracheal tubes. A bronchial blocker, however, has to be considered a high maintenance device during surgery. It is more likely to accidentally move out of position than a double lumen endotracheal tube is likely to move out of uh, position. However, that being said, the flip side of that coin is if you are using your fiber optic bronchoscopy and looking at it, if it moves out of position, Typically, it's not that difficult to move it back into position, but you do have to uh, continue to use video bronchoscopy. Uh, that should be the gold standard when you put it in initially, and again, use, uh, use uh, uh, video bronchoscopy anytime there is any question about uh, the positioning of the balloon. In lung isolation devices, the study was done that showed 39% of anesthesiologists with limited thoracic experience were unable to achieve lung separation successfully. And part of the reason for that is we really have very little time as anesthesiologists to study that anatomy. We're intraoperatively, we're typically 
being rushed somewhat to put either a double eliminated tracheal tube in or put a bronchial blocker in, get it in the position, and let's get on with the surgery. So we don't have the, the option of just sitting there and studying the anatomy and really learning that anatomy well. Now there is an internet available bronchoscopy simulator, and uh, anyone who's interested, I would encourage you to look at this site, this www.thoracic-anesthesia.com, because this allows you at home even to sit down with your computer and uh, through a simulation, place uh, endotracheal tubes, uh, look at the various anatomy, and really get uh, a better understanding of that. And part of the understanding of anatomy has to do with the measurements of what is where. And again, this is something we don't typically think about a lot, uh, that it is actually in a normal adult about 15 centimeters from the teeth to the uh, vocal cords, then from the vocal cords to where the right and left bronchi split about another 12 centimeters. So if you add that up, we're already at 27 centimeters before we even get there. The problem on the right side, of course, is there's very little room, one and a half to two centimeters between the carina and the takeoff of the right upper lobe. There's a little more distance on the left side, four to five centimeters, but if you're putting in a tube that has to go to the right side, you don't have much room before you are either occluding the right upper lobe or appropriately ventilating the right upper lobe. Now, I might point out before we go on, all these measurements I'm showing you right here apply to a patient of a normal height of five feet seven inches. Uh, if you're dealing with a taller patient, such as myself, you may find that those distances are just a bit longer than what's shown here. And likewise, for a shorter patient, those distances may be much shorter than this. So let's look at double luminated tracheal tubes. A double luminated tracheal tube actually can be thought of as two small lumen endotracheal tubes that are not equal length that are joined together. The shorter tube ends in the trachea while the longer tube uh, goes into the bronchus. The most common design now used is the Robert Shaw, although there have been other designs in the past. The, uh, the, the double lumen endotracheal tube was actually uh, first used by Carlin's, and the Carlin's endotracheal tube was shaped a little bit different than what we're using now, and the Carlin's actually even had a hook that hooked over the carina. Uh, but uh, uh, it's, it's, there were other modifications that have been introduced, but most commonly today, what you see is the Robert Shaw. So let's look at the Robert Shaw a little bit better. If you take a Robert Shaw into tracheal tube and cut it in half, uh, halfway from the, the uh, down the shaft of it, what you'll see is a double D-shaped design. And I'm gonna to refer to this as the depth of it and the length of it. The reason this is designed like this is to maximize the airway cross-section to the external diameter in both tubes, but this does increase airflow turbulence in the tube, and this can get to be uh, an issue in, in some uh, ventilation with uh, double eliminated tracheal tubes. We use fiber optic bronchoscopy, as I'd already mentioned, to confirm where the double lumen in the tracheal tube is. There are different designs of fiber optic uh, bronchoscopes. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll see some of these today. Um, one of the problems with having to put a fiber optic bronchoscope down a double lumen in the tracheal tube is that sometimes the smaller double lumen in the tracheal tubes may not allow enough room for the fiber optic bronchoscope to go through them. So if you're using a smaller double, uh, double lumen tracheal tube, you may actually need to use a pediatric bronchoscope, uh, which is 3.1 millimeter in diameter, compared to the standard size bronchoscope, which is 4.1 millimeters in diameter. I'll show you a little more about that here. If you look at this problem of the cross section of the depth this is the important thing because, of course, you've got more room here on the length than you do on the depth. So as I showed you in the prior slide, your fiber optic endotracheal, your fiber optic bronchoscope has to fit in the one side of the endotracheal tube. Well, notice if you've got uh, a, a tube that's smaller than a 35 French, the 
standard adult fiber optic endotracheal tube is not going to go down it. So you have to use a smaller uh, fiber optic bronchoscope. And even the pediatric fiber optic bronchoscopes wound up having a little bit of challenge going through something that's only 3.3 uh, millimeters wide when it's almost that wide. You've got to remember, you've got uh, plastic of the fiber optic bronchoscope, you've got plastic of the double lumen endotracheal tube, and the two tend to stick together uh, as, as one is passing through the other unless you've got plenty of clearance to allow it to pass through. Now, double lumen endotracheal tubes, in comparison to tracheal size, this graph shows you there's actually some people that it's almost impossible to put a double lumen endotracheal tube in because remember, not only do you have the size of the trachea to think about, but the vocal cord opening is actually even smaller than what this shows. So even though we've got a 12 millimeter opening and we've got a nine millimeter outer dimension small endotracheal tube, it's even got to go through a smaller area than 12, first of all, to get there. Uh, also, another thing to, to notice here is if you know anything about the outer dimensions of endotracheal tubes, a size 28 is about the same size as a 7.0 endotracheal tube for the outer dimensions. And by the time you get up here to like a 35, you're actually looking more like uh, a, a size 8 to size 9 normal endotracheal tube. So these larger double lumen endotracheal tubes, outer dimensions actually are more on the level of the comparable outer dimensions to much larger endotracheal tubes than you may think about for the, the patient. Another issue is in double lumen endotracheal tubes, you've got to think about the double lumen endotracheal tube and the length of your fiber optic bronchoscope. Most uh, double lumen endotracheal tubes are marked with a uh, tip up to 31 centimeters, but by the time you add the connectors on, the actual length is closer to 48 centimeters by the time you are putting a fiber optic bronchoscope through it. Well, if the length of the fiber optic bronchoscope is 60 centimeters, that's only leaving you about 12 centimeters to get out of the end of the endotracheal tube and look around in the airway to see what you need to see. So here's the design of a typical Robert Shaw double lumen endotracheal tube. I showed you a, a different picture of it a little earlier. And one of the designs is that this angle is almost 90 degrees and here is almost 90 degrees and they are rotated approximately 90 degrees away from each other to facilitate uh, placing the double lumen endotracheal tube where we want it to go. And when it is properly positioned uh, like this, it's barely past the carina. And what you see is just a little edge of the, the blue of the cuff uh, in the, the one side that you've put, placed it. The double lumen endotracheal tube connector also has some important uh, considerations. The fish mouth valve allows you to open this up, put a fiber optic bronchoscope in, look down into the endotracheal tube while you're still able to ventilate through the endotracheal tube since the other side is closed. Another important part is this soft tube segment up here because this is where you're going to clamp the double lumen endotracheal tube when you open one port for lung isolation. And this shows the double lumen endotracheal tube in place and this shows the clamp with the, with the open here to allow, in this case, the right lung to collapse. So you're preventing respiratory gases from coming in the right side, allowing the right side to equilibrate with uh, atmospheric pressure and therefore collapse the lung while the left lung, in this case, is continuing to be ventilated. So what says double lumen endotracheal tube we're we gonna put in? Well, surprisingly, there's no good hard and fast rules. There's some good guesses. You also have to be aware that if you're putting in a double lumen endotracheal tube because of those angles that I showed you earlier, they may be uh, causing trauma to the airway. So you need to be as gentle as you can with putting that in 
but yet at the same time get it in effectively. So here's some good guesses. Now that's all this is. This is a good starting point for uh, males versus females, for heights and placement of appropriate size double illuminated tracheal tubes, at least for a best guess. It's always a good idea to start here, but always have one double illuminated tracheal tube one size smaller than what you think you're going to use because sometimes you may get into some issues of not being able to put that uh, a supposedly appropriate sized double lumen and tracheal tube in place. In pediatrics it also gets to be even more of a challenge uh, because pediatric airways may be very different sizes uh, regardless of the age. Again, here are good guesses as to where to start. Uh, notice that uh, there are right and left side double, double lumen endotracheal tubes, but the size 28 and 26 are available only as a left-sided tube, not as a right-sided tube. And here's sort of the differences in what a left-sided tube and right-sided tube looks like. The distal curves are actually mirror images of each other. The, uh, the cuff up here is pretty much the same. The angles are still about the same, but they're mirror images. The right side also has a different kind of cuff so that the right side can still ventilate that right upper lobe while the typical uh, opening is able to ventilate the rest of the lung. That's not an issue uh, on the, uh, the, the, the left side of the double lumen and tracheal tubes. Uh, so left side double lumen and tracheal tubes are certainly easier to position because you don't have to worry about trying to position it just correctly so that you can ventilate that right upper lobe. It's believed to result in fewer complications. The traditional thinking is use a right side tube when surgery's on the left and use the left side tube when surgery's on the right uh, to help avoiding uh, suturing or stapling the endotracheal tube to the remaining, remaining bronchial stump if part of that lung is taken out. Uh, but you must be very careful to be sure that you can remove the endotracheal tube uh, at the end of surgery uh, without uh, taking a lot of lung tissue out with it if it happens to be sutured or stapled down. Left side tubes are generally considered to be easier to position correctly than right side tubes. It's believed that it results in fewer complications. Um, how are you going to put in a double limit endotracheal tube? Well, Let's talk about the typical endotracheal tube that goes into the left side of the lungs. You typically start with the distal curve being directed anteriorly, place that through the vocal cords, and often it's recommended to remove the stylus, uh, to remove the, the, the stylet immediately after the tip gets through the endotracheal tube, uh, the, the, tube, the tip of the endotracheal tube gets through the vocal cords, and then rotate 90 degrees to the left or rotate counterclockwise as the tube is being advanced. And the approximate proper depth is the final, for the final position is 12 plus the patient height in centimeter divided by 10, but the real way of figuring out if you're in the right place or not is use fiber optic bronchoscopy. Uh, take a look, make sure that it is positioned as I showed you in the earlier picture. Positioning the double lumen in a tracheal tube, uh, the, bronch the bronchoscope helps you know that you're in the right place. The best way to use it is put it through the bronchial lumen first. Uh, if you don't see what you want to see, then pull back the double lumen tube until the carina is visualized. Pass the bronchoscope into the left main stem bronchus and then advance the tube over the fiber optic bronchoscope to help get it in as easy as possible. Now, I mentioned right side double lumen tracheal tubes a little bit earlier and said they really were not too popular. And here's the reason they're not very popular. The use of them are really are not common now because it is difficult to position that right sided tube just exactly right so that this right upper lobe with a takeoff that's only one and a half or two centimeters away from the carina, uh, it, it's hard to get it to where that's positioned exactly right to ventilate that. So that's one caveat and another problem is this. There are anatomic variations. 
not all people are built with that right upper lobe bronchus coming off in the right place. Look at this. Here's the right upper lobe bronchus actually coming off the side of the trachea. And this is supposed to be occurring in about 3% of the patients. Um, fortunately, we don't see that 3% of patients very often, but this is a risk. And if you've got a right-sided double lumen endotracheal tube, there's just not going to be any way of properly positioning that to ventilate that uh, right upper lobe and still get the lung isolation that you're looking for. So malpositioning of a double lumen endotracheal tube is certainly the most common cause of intraoperative hypoxia during one lung ventilation. Uh, it, uh, if you look at this, about 3% of the patients uh, are supposed to have the tube malpositioned. Fiber optic bronchoscopy identifies most of the malpositioning that you miss by just listening to the outside of the chest. Um, any movement of the double lumen endotracheal tube, you need to take a look again with fiber optic bronchoscopy. Now I'm going to tell you something that is a new development that I think is really pretty exciting. There is a new company, uh, ET View. They make a tube, endotracheal tube called a Vitasite. And we'll be able to show you this this afternoon. The Vitasite actually has a tiny video camera built in right here at the tip. So the Vitasite can continue to view the endotracheal tube position completely throughout the surgery. It's available both in single lumen and double lumen tubes. And with the single lumen tube, then uh, it's designed so that a bronchial blocker can easily be put in place and can be continually viewed throughout the operation uh, to be sure that it stays in place. This is how it's connected. The, the, it looks like a fairly standard endotracheal tube. This, I might point out, is the single lumen version. The, there are uh, double lumen versions, and the connections are essentially the same. There's a little wire that comes out of it that connects, and this cable then goes to a video monitor. Uh, there is one thing that's different about this tube is the flush hub, because they recognized early on that occasionally secretions obscure the camera at the end of the, in the tracheal tube. So this gives you a place that you can flush a small amount of saline and clean off that camera lens if you need to. Uh, again, this is not a common problem, but it's certainly something that can happen. And the uh, uh, inflation port is just exactly the same as we've seen on any other in the tracheal tube. It allows for continuous airway monitoring. And that's the big advantage of this particular uh, design of an endotracheal tube. Uh, it can be viewed continuously, it can be repositioned easily, and one other thing we even found with this in the simulation lab if, is that surprisingly this endotracheal tube can be properly positioned even without a laryngoscope. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of double lumen tubes or bronchial blockers? Well, here's uh, a, a quick list. Conversion of from two lung to one lung ventilation is easy and reliable if you've got a double lumen endotracheal tube. Not so much if you've got a bronchial blocker. Uh, but a bronchial blocker is less likely to cause damage to the airway. Uh, it, the, as I mentioned earlier, bronchial blocker is a high maintenance device where the double lumen endotracheal tube, once it's put in place, is not so high maintenance, but there is considered to be more difficulty placing it and uh, greater risk of, of damage to the cuff. So what are the problems with one lung ventilation? Problems deal primarily with ventilation perfusion mismatch. And I'm going to go through some, some kind of simplistic uh, looks at ventilation perfusion mismatch. But uh, we need to go through some math for us to do that. So in a typical adult, one liter of blood holds about 200 cc's of oxygen, and one liter of air has a little more than the 200 cc's of oxygen. So by the time the air goes in, humidification reduces that to about 200 mils. So ideally, this gives you a ventilation to perfusion match of one to one. However, because of zones in the lungs, uh, you have actually a ventilation to perfusion match 
uh, ratio of about 0 0.8. If you've got one lung ventilation, no ventilation to one lung, and you've got blood flow to that lung, and ventilation and blood flow to the other lung, that creates a 50% ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, so let's look at the normal gas exchange in the alveolus. And again, I'm, I'm going to say right offhand, this is much more simplified than what you heard yesterday. I'm not considering the effects of hemoglobin. I'm just looking at the gases dissolved in the, the fluid. If you notice, the pH uh, changes a little bit from venous to arterial as it goes through the lung. The alveolar gas, by the time it gets to the lung, has a, a PO2 content of about 150. And because ventilation occurs, the PCO2 in the alveolus stays around 35. Well, as this venous gas passes the alveolus, they pretty much come to equilibrium by the time it gets to the arterial side. So if you start with a PCO2 of 46 and you've got a PCO2 of 35 in the alveolus, you wind up with a PCO2 of about 40 on the arterial side. Likewise, if you're coming back with a PO2 of only 40 and your PO2 in the alveolus is 150, you wind up with around a 95% PO2 going into the arterial side. And that's the way ventilation should occur. Now, here's the problem. If we've got a non-ventilated alveolus that's closed off, uh, then the venous PCO2 and the venous PO2 passing by here, again, quickly equilibrate, but they don't change. It stays 46 and, and about 40 as it came through the venous side while the arterial side is getting well oxygenated. So when we get them back through the lungs and they come back together, you've got the oxygenated and non-oxygenated, what happens then is the lung is not doing what we want it to do and we're only coming out with a PO2 of about 67 before it goes circulating to the rest of the body. Now, let's look at the oxygen content of blood and let's take some hemoglobin into here. And again, this is under normal situations, not under acidosis or any other uh, unusual situation. If you look at blood oxygen content, it's oxygen that's attached to hemoglobin plus the oxygen dissolved in serum. So there's some formulas that can quickly be used to tell us how much oxygen actually winds up in there. So a normal mixed venous saturation is about 60 to 80 percent and a normal arterial saturation is 100 percent. So if we just simply plug in those numbers, what we come up with is the arterial content comes out to about 16.6 uh, milligrams per deciliter, where the mixed venous content is only about 11 uh, and a half milligrams per deciliter. So, if you think of this in a little different way, what this is telling us is the oxygen uptake from the body with each circulation is about 16 minus 11, so about 5 milligrams for each 100 cc's of blood that goes through the heart and through the body. So each cardiac contraction ejects about 70 cc's of blood in an adult. So in the resting state, we can say the body's going to remove about 5 milligrams per deciliter of oxygen from blood. So a primary job of the lungs is to put that 5 milligrams per deciliter back into the blood. But the problem is a non-ventilated alveolus quickly assumes the PO2 and PCO2 of the mixed venous blood and that in turn mixes with the oxygenated blood, so we're starting out with a much lower oxygen concentration and a somewhat higher CO2 concentration than we want. And we wind up very quickly, within a few minutes, of achieving a blood oxygen concentration in hemoglobin of about 70%. And you know what? That's basically the saturation of the mixed venous blood. So this, of course, depends on no increases in metabolic demand, uh, tissue uptake remaining constant. So if, if those things change, temperature changes, uh, all these numbers, of course, would be different than what I'm showing you here. But how do we prevent this problem when we've got one lung ventilation of just quickly winding up with uh, an oxygen saturation that's too low to sustain life? Well, one of the things that happens is hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. This was originally uh, described in 1946 when they were doing some experiments with uh, pulmonary artery pressures and somewhat hypoxic situations. They had 10.5% uh, inspired oxygen, in other words, half of the oxygen in room air, and they found that 
HPV takes effect over about 30 minutes and peaks at about two hours. And an interesting phenomenon is that if they had hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and then released it and then did it again, a second instance of hypoxia produced a more profound response than the first uh, incidence of hypoxia. So what they found was hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction works better when about 30 to 70 percent of the lung was hypoxic. If uh, uh, there's uh, less than 30 percent of the lung that's hypoxic, there's not enough lung to shunt from. And if greater than 70 percent of the lung is hypoxic, there's basically no place to shunt the hypoxic blood. So we've learned that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction helped us shunt blood away from areas that were not being oxygenated. So one lung ventilation produces 30 to 70 percent hypoxia in uh, total lung volume. All right, so drug effects. We know that drugs affect hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, but how bad do they affect it? Well, propofol basically has no effect on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. All of our inhalational anesthetics inhibit hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction to some extent, some worse than others. Uh, Sevoflurane, interestingly, at one MAC, exhibits a minimal effect on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. A lot of our basal active agents, such as nitroglycerin, nitroprusside, uh, decrease hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction or inhibit it, and there's some situations such as alkalemia infection that also inhibit it. Anything that increases the pulmonary artery pressure, uh, whether that's uh, vasopressors that are used, volume overload, uh, mitral stenosis, all these phenomena inhibit hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. But the real question is, in our clinical practice, does hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction really make any difference and what I might say to you is yes and no. In one lung ventilation, inhalation anesthetics reach the operative lung through the bloodstream only because obviously we're not ventilating that lung, so the anesthesia agents aren't getting there through the alveolus. And studies have shown that hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, or actually I should say the inhibition of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction with inhalational anesthetics is much more effective when that inhalational anesthetic is exposed to that alveolus uh, through inhalation rather than through the bloodstream. So more current studies have really shown after even 20 to 30 minutes of one lung ventilation, there's no significant differences in PaO2 when compared to IV inhalational anesthetics when you're using uh, uh, a, a measure of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. So the not hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, I probably really said the wrong thing here. It, hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction is good in theory, but our anesthetics don't really have as much effect on hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction as we may have thought in the past. There is an excellent article addressing hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction uh, that has just been published this month in anesthesiology. So if you really want to know more about hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, its physiology, and, and how it affects anesthesia, I would encourage you to take a look at this article, this month's Journal of Anesthesiology. So how do we compensate? To, to finish this, this talk, how do we compensate for hypoxia that occurs in one lung ventilation? And here are ways of doing it. Increase the oxygen to the ventilated lung, Try to avoid agents that you know interfere with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction to the extent that you can. Uh, in a general anesthesia, there's no way to avoid interfering, uh, avoid using anything that interferes with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Adding positive end expiratory pressure to the non-ventilated lung can help. The good news with hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction and ventilating one lung is that the body almost helps us with this because when we're doing one lung ventilation, typically we're doing it for a surgical procedure. The surgeon needs to access that lung, so that lung that we're collapsing is up. The patient's on their side, the ventilated lung is lower. Gravity still works inside the body. The blood tends to perfuse the lower ventilated lung more than it perfuses 
the upper non-ventilated lung. So as long as that ventilated lung is in a dependent position, gravity helps us. So this helps reduce the VQ mismatch. And the bottom line really is try to minimize the time of doing one lung ventilation. And this helps uh, a patient get through hypoxia effects that occur with double lumen endotracheal tubes. And uh, this is a, uh, a small print, but a list of references that uh, deal with this discussion. And I think now it's about time for lunch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sauce. So we'll take a quick lunch break since we are running late on time, and I request everyone to be back by 12 so, so that we can listen to another great lecture by Dr. Martinez.